Hi, welcome to Get Lit. My name is Pete Crooks. I'm senior editor and senior writer at Diablo Magazine. We're here at the Walnut Creek Public Library, and on Get Lit, we meet local writers and today artists who uh, are contributing to the East Bay's arts and culture scene. Uh, today, we're here with Tom Franco, who is an Oakland-based artist and um, has illustrated some really, really wonderful um, pages in a book called Naked by his mother, Betsy Franco. Welcome, Tom. Thanks Thank for you. coming to get this. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Let's start with your background. You grew up in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. and talk, talk about your, uh, your upbringing and, and how you found uh, your direction to the arts. I grew up in Palo Alto, which is just across the Bay, and I was going to Pali High School. And they had a, a decent art program, but I actually started taking uh, figure drawing classes through the city program which was like the Pacific Art League or um, there's, a, there's two of them over there that they just remodeled and they had uh, the after school so I, my brother was doing it before me my older brother and then my parents were like well do you want to do it it's like sure mm -hmm. and um, the youngest in the class <laughs> you know they're Noon model, so okay. I'd be in there and they'd be looking like right at me, it felt like. <laughs> but but uh, it was when um, I took a ceramic figure modeling class with the man who just retired over there, Bill Ayakola, that I, I found sculpture, which I felt like, oh yeah, this is something that I can really do. And no grades, no pressure of schools, just the fun of people wanting to make art. So before we get into to your career path or in, in your path as an artist, just the, the idea that the community that you grew up in had these extracurricular offerings for you. Like what does that mean to you as, as far as like the opportunities you were given to be exposed to arts and to have, you know, have, these, uh, have these resources to you know, develop your interest and your, and your style? Super cool that those exist and they still exist. And actually both of them are being remodeled this past year. Mm -hmm. And um, the only thing that was missing for me in that was that there wasn't enough young people there. It's like, okay, well, it was the uh, adults who were coming doing uh, a type of schooling that you didn't have to get a degree in. You could just come and, and learn art, uh, which I found later on. There's so many people like that. Uh, Palo Alto definitely has its share. East Bay, I find it's so much bigger. There's that the artists, people who want to be artists of all ages are flocking or living and uh, uh, thriving in the East Bay and can be isolated doing their art. So to have a place where it can be united and you can meet people and network that way or even show, have shows, get people to see your art, huge. Uh, culturally, it's, it's a big deal. That's fantastic. What is it about the East Bay? I mean, Palo Alto and Walnut Creek, you know, as, as far as like civic infrastructures are pretty similar. The Walnut Creek has a civic arts program that sounds pretty similar to, to what, you, sure. what you had. But what is it about the East Bay area that kind of is a magnet for? I think it's more culturally diverse is what the, the draw is. And in situations like that, the collaboration is on a higher level. It's not necessarily about money or facilities or access. People are going to do it because it's in the air. So uh, it's, it's that kind of mixing. And it's not just culture. Um, for in, in my work now, it's we, we also attribute it to uh, a mixing of ages. Particularly with ages, to have those diverse perspectives has to feed the creative process, right? Yes, yes. And uh, something that came alive for me more outside of school, because I, I did go to... Uh, I got my bachelor degree in art at UC Santa Cruz and then took uh, undergraduate classes at California College of the Arts in Oakland mm -hmm. so when I moved to Oakland about 12 years ago. Um, but it wasn't until I got out of the academic situation where this idea of, oh, what does it take to have a studio, have people around you making stuff, uh, do shows, it suddenly became this whole thing about what is culture and uh, what does that mean? It's such a living art. I'm the director of the Firehouse Art Collective, which runs event spaces and studios and apartments for artists, is that we're creating this lifestyle of uh, being an artist. Being an artist or being artsy, it's, it's almost like it's, it's not big enough of a container. Mm -hmm. So it, it needs to incorporate all aspects of life. So um, we found that out when we were just doing studios and it was like, 
people would move away and we'd be invested in these people. And it's like, oh, well, we have to have places for them to live too. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of grows like that. The East Bay may be a, a magnet for artists, but it's still difficult as an artist, I'm sure, to maintain residency and have the space and resources to do that. A friend of mine uh, is in an apartment in the Chelsea Hotel in New York. And there's such this terrific history of, of all this music and, 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 and artistry that was going on there. But it's being renovated into like super plush condos. <laughs> and like the last of the, the true believers are being shoved out one by one. And it's really sad and yeah. tragic, but it's the, the reality of the time. Talk about um, the, uh, your, your motivation and the, and the inspiration to, to create the Firehouse Artists Collective, which is in Berkeley and is, is soon to open a, s a second uh, space in Th Oakland? Fifth location. Fifth location. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go through the beginning of it because it's, okay. it's the 10th anniversary this year of, yeah. of the... the uh, so how did this begin? Uh, left art school, decided that my master's program would be self-invented. I wouldn't do the, the academic version. Mm -hmm. I would do my own version because I wanted to, to put into practice you know, my ideas instead of just kind of talk about it. So it was about eight of us that got together and, and rented a, our first building over by the Ashby BART station okay, in South yeah. Berkeley. And run down building. We're still trying to fix it up 10 years later. But that was the beginning. It had studios, it has storefronts, and it has four apartments upstairs. And it's people who needed to have a place to live anyways. Uh, people who are gonna make art no matter what, if it was in their room. Th the risk is that if you're not in the community, you're not gonna make your art. It, you, you get bogged down by bills and work and da da da. So that cultivated for about uh, four years, and uh, we learned a lot of, about our, our uh, functioning structure. Mm -hmm. And uh, about four years into it, I became the director, the main director, and I partnered with my girlfriend, Julia Lazar. We do everything together now, at this point. And there was enough artwork being made that we needed to expand and do shows. And the problem with that is that <laughs> then you have to hustle the gallery circuit and be mm -hmm. like, oh, will you please show my art? And, Oh, even like cafes, like you're like, oh, easy cafe, that, that's easy to do. Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> not so easy. There's weird <laughs> politics and yeah. stuff involved with Everybody getting has it. their own ideas, right? right? Yeah. And there's so many artists right. to that want to show. So we had to have our own space. And so uh, I felt like that was the only way that I could really have my own art show, is to have my own gallery. Mm -hmm. So we got a gallery in North Berkeley, which was in a more of a, a livelier, retail scene, a lot of restaurants. It's, they call it the Gourmet Ghetto mm -hmm. area. And we've been there for now five years. We just okay. renewed that lease. And uh, it slowly pushed into um, larger studio spaces. Like we have this amazing project that came to fruition because of the gallery contacts that we made there on Gilman Street in North Berkeley. We have a new landlord now and they built us a second story, 6,000 square foot studio room, bay views. Wow. They built it for us, okay, because we were there and they wanted to promote arts. They're putting Whole Foods, Phil's Coffee, Donut Dolly, Farm Burger in there and it's gonna be like a the hottest new, new destination for Berkeley. That's great. This morning, we met with our other landlords, um, also by the Ashby Bart and our friends where we're putting in a new uh, beer and wine garden restaurant in what has been our largest event space. We're gonna reinvigorate the oldest standing movie theater in Berkeley, which has been obsolete for many years. The old theater was known for being a jazz house in, the, in most recent years, but they had to close. So we're, we're gonna do events in the jazz house room, and then uh, we have this, it's a, it's a large complex, and we have uh, room for doing, we have Ross's Cafe in there, we have uh, the Tarot woman right now who does vintage clothes, so we have like, four more micro storefronts where people who are at that level can rent affordably a storefront, do their art, have their product, whatever it is. You know, wh it doesn't have to be painting. It can be what they want to do. And events come in 100, 200 people at a time. Everybody gets exposure, have a good time. And that's culture. That's you know, fantastic. People can live that. They, people will travel to, to hit that up. So. This is not easy to do. The bureaucratic tape that has to be uh, <laughs> circumvented and the, just the energy and um, logistics of this kind of uh, 
you know, infrastructure planning that you've got going. It sounds like you've got a really cool team of partners and you've had some connections with landlords or whatever who appreciate what you're trying to do. Most fortunate. Um, but you're also a sculptor and an illustrator. Like, is it, is it stressful to balance the... Uh, yes. It, it uh, well, it's, it's two different sides of the brain, right? right? And I think, uh, I think I get the business from my father who was heavily, he, he kind of had that oversight of, of being creative and math and business and all these different things happening. So I picked up a lot of the business side and, and talking to people naturally from that. And then my mom's been a writer f since I was born, made a living and raised the family off of writing books, which is like, really? Yeah. So, and she didn't stop, she kept at it. And, and her whole message to the world is s targeting young people is you can do it. You can be a creative person and live that way. I've, I've developed it in the area of the visual arts first and then grew from there. But I have to do my art at my house uh, with Julia because uh, if we use space in any of our buildings then people ask me, oh, can, we, can you fix the window, can you do this? <laughs> <laughs> it's too distracting because of all the logistics that are required. To right. That's amazing. Um, and so wh wh when are you happiest? Like when are you at your most like creatively pulsing, you know, uh, enjoyment of life. I've always been a little bit hesitant to only do art. It's something about like, is this okay? <laughs> am, I gonna, am I gonna run out of ideas or energy or okay. am I gonna get isolated? I don't like any of those things. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I've, I've learned to trick my brain into creative processes. And one of the best things that I've discovered at uh, CCA was um, and, and doing dance, uh, dance and Tai Chi classes and visual arts was collaboration. So working on a piece of art, like, like a sculpture, a very dis uh, physical thing, and maybe in the moment with another artist making it or passing it back and forth, having two pass back and forth. So you have this idea, oh, I'm making this, and then somebody totally goes over the top and you're like, what? That's, a, you just changed it. Like, I can't do the same thing anymore. Uh -huh. But there's a, a, a creative flow, so there's still energy in it, and you have to figure it out and, and keep going and, and, and be t you know, totally let go. Um, I know that happens a lot in other mediums. Uh, books, for sure, have that element, more or less, different degrees. Um, live performance, acting, dancing, music, uh, uh, essential. You have to have that uh, know-how. Visual arts somehow has slipped into the area where you don't have to <laughs> do that to be the visual artist, which is we're missing out. That's a shame. It's a, we're being robbed. Huh. And, and s you s then people, s visual artists tend to slip into isolation and say, oh, I'm a private artist. Oh, give me a room where nobody can see me making my stuff. It's like half of the beauty of what gets made is watching the person make the work when there's documentation of artists that we know making their work that's so valuable I can learn so much from that just watching them do it so that has tricked me into um, sticking with it and, and uh, um, finding new ways to stay in the creative process you know being activated by my fellows that's fascinating now you were talking about this piece that you brought to, to show us and um, there's a steer storyteller telling a story with a, with a still piece of art. Yeah. I think that's very, very interesting. Can you kind of tell us this story? This story, um, it's, it's called the Four Shoe Face Brothers who grew up with their teacher in, in the jungle and uh, they're learning how to be part of the community and they get sent on this quest to help the neighboring village play a basketball game and it's uh, jungle ball and they have to help these guys win the game to claim the, the land to either be a basketball court or a cornfield. And so it's, it's their uh, coming of age kind of uh, in training as the Shoe Face Brothers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's awesome, man. And uh, did, uh, is there any competition for branding with the Shoe Face Brothers, like Adidas versus Nike <laughs> versus Puma? Well, no, because I, I smother them with paint. You can't yeah. tell what they are anywhere. <laughs> right. This is a year's worth of dunking and dripping paint on mm. it. And then the final move is to put these characters on it that are 
obviously a person. But before that, it's way abstract. I'm like, outer space, no, uh, this, which comes from the collaboration process, no holding on or, or, or um, identifying what the thing is. Yeah. And it sounds like there's so much work that goes into this, a year of, of paint layers to give the piece density and meaning yeah. while you're meditating on what this is going to become. Yeah. Uh, so how much time did this, this piece take? Well, I try to, uh, what ha happens is I, I do about 10 or so pieces at once mm -hmm. so that I can let something dry and jump back and forth and, and again, trick myself not to think too hardly, uh, intently about any meaning uh -huh. going into a piece, but let it reveal itself as it goes. This piece took a year, but um, some have taken three years because they need to sit around longer and digest and it's like, and not quite feeling it. But then when the moment strikes, uh, something is finished and then it's like, oh yeah, it was totally worth it. I mean, I, I love it at the beginning and then it's like, ah, struggle, struggle, struggle and sit, uh, sit in the corner, I'll go in the corner. And then I hate it. Like I don't like it, don't get it. It's, I don't like it, don't like it. And then a year later, boom, happens. And it's like, oh yeah, that's it. That's the story, got it. So I have to have like, at least 10 or else <laughs> you don't get to the oh yeah part. <laughs> okay. So, and, and are you like, is, does the oh yeah happen in the presence of the piece? Or sometimes are you like at the Gilman Street location and all of a sudden the gourmet ghetto piece, or you're the, obviously it's home because you said you work on yeah. stuff at home. Uh, are, are, are those creative connections necessarily um, relevant to you being experiencing the piece? You know, in no, person. I, it, it can happen away from the work. And uh, usually there's a small piece missing, like let's say the players aren't there, but I, I'm very familiar with the piece and the, and the, the movement on it. So, uh, you know, if I, I, I have a daily meditation practice, so often I'll, I'll be sitting quiet and be thinking about a piece comes up in my mind and then it's like, oh, like this could be basketballs on the bottles. Mm. It's like, oh, that's a great solution. Why don't I try it? This is, uh, this is just amazing stuff. And, and um, the collaborative process, obviously, is very rewarding for you with other artists. Yeah, thank you so much for what you've done for this East Bay area. It's talking about your relationship with your parents and what you got, like what the DNA and the life experience you got from them. I, what's it like to collaborate with your, your mom on such a uh, fascinating, sort of magical, ethereal book? Um, to share that experience with, with a parent. It's fabulous. So with the book Naked that I did with Betsy, because she's pulling influence from Rodin's sculptures and Camille Claudel's sculptures, and so they even come to life in the story. And so she asked me to illustrate the sculptures, which is like a whole collaboration with a famous artist who's not alive anymore. And she even brings Camille Claudel back to life. And so it's like this, this interdisciplinary uh, crossing over of time and age and and different cultures and uh, the the challenges of the different eras of being an artist. The hardest part about it is breaking into the publication world. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's all these rules and and uh, uh, technical aspects that you're supposed to just know. And if you don't know it, good luck. Like you're going to take years to do it. Mm -hmm. So slow and I. It's even slow for me. Like I, I'm trying to get this book published, and it's like, who's gonna do it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, she's cracked the code already, and she gets published every year. So to have her say, "Hey, would you like to be part of this?" Not only am I, I feel familiar and comfortable with her style of writing and and the characters that she forms. Sometimes she uses my drawings uh, as a catalyst. Like in the case of the last book we did, Metamorphosis, Junior Year. She used my high school drawings that her high school character drew in the book. It's like, okay, well, that's a huge compliment. <laughs> that's great. So sometimes it's the illo forcing, uh, uh, inspiring the words, and sometimes just the opposite. The yeah, sure. That's, that's remarkable. She takes that risk. Now, you grew up in a, in a home where you, your parent was publishing a book. Every, I mean, your mom's published over 80 Books over eighty books. That's r remarkable. I mean, but wha who were the the writers, um, and what were the books that, at, at a young age, at a formative age, inspired you creatively? Like when you went to the bu public library, when you were taking an art class, like what did you take home with you? Zweig, who who made Shrek, 
not s so much technically for his drawing craft, which was so easy and fun to look at, but more for his whimsical story play. He was a father and you know, he'd tell stories to his kids or whatever like that. And, uh, his sense of character and, and, and um, suspense, like, oh my God, but not being too scary. Mm -hmm. Sylvester and the Magic Pebble had that, like, oh my God, he turned into a rock. Right, that's so <laughs> terrific. Uh, there's something about those children's books and the, um, the imaginative space in illustration that I still think about books all the time that I read 35 years ago. Uh, I'll give you an example, that, you know, Seize Candies? There's a, Bordeaux is this candy that has kind of a maple sugar filling. Okay. And I always, there's something very comforting about that. It may just be a huge sugar rush, but, <laughs> um, but I realized what it was. There was a children's book I read called The Biggest Bear, but it's about a little boy who's supposed to go out and hunt a bear because everybody in his, in his in, he's in the Ozarks or something, everybody has a bear hide on his wall. And he finds his bear cub and he can't pull the trigger. And so he takes this bear as a pet and feeds it these lumps of maple sugar. And the illustrations are so beautiful in that book. And I went and found it at the library recently again because I realized I always wanted to eat that lump of maple <laughs> sugar. And when I finally tasted the Bordeaux, that's what it was. You know, it's got a chocolate wrapping around it. Yeah. But it's almost like this, uh, this experience of, um, of actually being able to sense the art in a different form than you know, just visually, yeah, and yeah, able yeah. to taste it. Yeah. And uh, that just brought s a nostalgic this wave of appreciation and pleasure for that book. It's just wonderful how that book still exists today. A, a, a five-year-old can go pull it off the shelf yeah. and have that experience with totally. it. And that's what that creative totally. effect is, you know. Well, here's the other thing you're bringing up for me is, is that uh, some of the best children's books, you know, hands down, nominated by everybody, are the ones that wouldn't get published today because they're too edgy. I mean, they're totally digestible and not too over the top, but it's a risk for a publisher to create it because they don't know if everybody's going to love it. Mm -hmm. So it's this catch-22 of, because uh, people, especially my girlfriend says, you're not writing children's books. These are like, you should market it to adults because <laughs> they're, they have more mature content. And it's like, well, you know, what are you talking about is basketball players and shoe faces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like, no, no, no. If there's something, it, you have to break in somehow. And, and the best people had that challenge. So uh, uh, um, it, it also reminds me of um, Silverstein. Shel Silverstein. Yeah. Who did adult comics. So did Dr. Seuss. Did adult comics, right. not for kids at right, all. Right. Yertle the Turtle is Hitler, right? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's, that's, but that's, that's, uh, that's on the easy reader's <laughs> shelf over there. Yeah. But at that point in his career, it, a kid could read it and yeah. not get that. It doesn't have to be Hitler. Right. But his other stuff was political comics or whatever mm -hmm. like that. So they had to break out. They had to somehow, somebody had to believe in them to, to get it out there. Right, and those books are on the shelf. We see it, and it's wonderful that they exist. And we can still talk about it. It's great. Totally. Hey, Tom, this has been just a fascinating conversation. So thanks so much for coming out to the Walnut Creek Public oh, yeah. Library. Thanks for having me. And thank you so much for all you're doing with your Firehouse Collective because that is giving so many artists an opportunity to have that space and have that community. And that's uh, greatly appreciated, I'm sure, by your artist community, but also all of us in the East Bay that appreciate the arts. Thank you so much. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, yeah. And thank you at home for watching Get Lit. This is so much fun for me to get to talk to authors and artists. I can't, I can't tell you what a thrill this is. Um, please uh, read more about this in Diablo Magazine. Come support the Walnut Creek Public Library and all the, all the libraries in the community. And uh, tune in again to Get Lit. Thanks for watching. <laughs>